So this book of First Peter, I'm kind of excited about because I like Peter. If you have got a Bible with you this morning, uh, if you're looking for the book of First Peter, it's sort of between Hebrews and Revelation. And so like if you are kind of flipping around and you see some guy named Melchizedek walking around and doing things, you're, you know, I haven't gone far enough yet, you're in Hebrews. And if you see like dragons and blood coming out of people's eyes and weird things happening, that's Revelation. And so you went too far. Uh, so it's kind of in between those two. You'll find it uh, there pretty quickly, I hope. And here's the thing about Peter. I love this guy because uh, I, I kind of relate to him. You know, there's a couple of guys, especially that we talk about in the New Testament uh, other than Jesus. And we talk about Peter a lot because he was one of the leaders of the disciples. Uh, we also talk about Paul. Uh, and Paul, he's that guy, I look at Paul and I think, you know, that guy, he's got it all together. He's educated. He's got a good looking haircut. Uh, you know, he's got, wears button down shirts, tucked in khaki pants that are pleated with the cuff, penny loafers, uh, you know, a nice Gucci belt. Uh, I see that guy all put together. Then there's Peter, he's like a fisherman. And he sort of talks Southern is what I figure. And he wears uh, Crocs and camouflage pants. He's my kind of guy. Uh, so I, I, I like him a lot, you know, because if you ain't crocking, you ain't rocking, right? So uh, I have orange Crocs. I know some of you are like today, where's your orange? Well, it's because it's not clean, but it'll probably make an appearance next week. Um, but it, anyway, here, here's the deal is that, is that Peter is a lot like a lot of us in that he really chased hard after God uh, and, and really wanted to walk closely with Jesus. And then he would kind of mess up. You know, this is the guy that, that uh, you know, that Jesus on the one hand says, uh, you know, Simon, blessed are you. Uh, and then five minutes later, like he called him like Satan, like you're, you're doing what the devil wants you to do. And, you know, and Peter says, I will never turn away from you. But then he denies him three times. Uh, and, and just one thing after another, he's kind of, hey, I'm there, I'm here, I'm there. And so the, the author, let's do a little background here on this book. So the author is Peter and, and A.W. Tozer says this. And if you're not familiar with A.W. Tozer, you should be, you ought to read some of his books. Start with The, uh, the Pursuit of God. That's a good one to start with. Uh, it says, the apostle Peter is a bundle of contradictions. I love that quote. I think I would like to put that on my tombstone. Uh, Arthur, a bundle, he was a bundle of contradictions. I, I, I love that because on the one hand, he was really chasing hard after Jesus and was walking right with him. And then he goes and does his own thing. And he says, oh, I screwed up. I should come back. I should come back. And the truth is, I think this is a good thing really is the longer he walked with Jesus, the more he worshiped him. So although Peter's life was up and down like this a lot, it was up and down, but always growing. Uh, so it's sort of like that. So let's get started with this. We'll do a little bit more background on this in just a minute, but let's start with the first verse of the book. It says, first Peter uh, 1, 1, it says, Peter, and remember this is like, this is the name Jesus gave him because his given name was Simon. And so this name Peter means rock an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now it's here at the very beginning of the letter so that when you unroll a scroll, you go, oh, this is who it's from. So you don't have to read all the way to the end to find out who it's from. Uh, so this would be important. People go, ooh, this is Peter. This is not just anybody, this is something important. Uh, and he says, it's to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You're like, whoop-de-doo. Uh, what are those places? Well, that's, that was Asia Minor, uh, modern day Turkey. And he says uh, that these people have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And so he writes this very specifically to Christ followers. He doesn't say this is to everybody. He says it's to the elect. Uh, so let's talk about the audience here for just a minute. So the first thing is, is it's to the, to the elect. It's to those who uh, have a relationship with God through his son Jesus. And it's for those people who are Christians then and for those of us who are Christ followers now. This is written just for us. This is not for everybody. It is for Christ followers. And not only that, he says for those who are scattered. And as I was praying about some things this summer, and trying to figure out, hey, what are we going to teach in the middle of everything that's going on? I just really believe that God just kept bringing me back to First Peter. Uh, and that's where we get the, this name uh, of the series scattered from the very first book because what happened is the Christ followers, uh, they didn't know that this was going to happen. You know, uh, 3,000 of them coming to Christ, 5,000 of them coming to know Christ in Jerusalem. And it's just like, and it's, 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 it's incredible. And then a little bit of persecution comes and they get scattered. And so things happen, and it wasn't really bad persecution. Now, it, it, 
and he'll talk about this morning as we go through this passage, he'll talk about his various trials. And so there were different things, but and then later on it becomes fiery trials he talks about. Uh, this is in, written in around 63 AD. Peter was crucified upside down about 67 AD. Uh, he was crucified upside down because he said, according to church tradition and some extra biblical sources, that he did not want to be crucified in the same manner that Jesus was crucified. So he asked his captors, could he please be crucified upside down so all the blood flowed to his head. It's probably a pretty painful way to die. Um, but that they had been, the, the, the Christ followers had been scattered and they had been all together. And I, I brought this little salt shaker with me today because, I, you know, I think sometimes this is, we think this is great. Uh, and this is sort of what, what church can become. You know, here, we're, we're all in the salt shaker together. And this is great. And we can all be in here and we can all be salty. <laughs> And we go, ooh, look at how salty you are. Well, you're not as salty as I am. I'd like to be salty too. And, and we can talk about, we can compare, you know, are we a big grain of salt or a little grain of salt or are we more salty than the others? And we can, we can do all this kind of stuff. And it's great because it, it, it's safe and all the salt in here feels like, oh, well, I'm in a good place and I understand where I am and there's not much going to change and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? The, the salt, as long as it stays in the salt shaker, it's almost useless. But when you scatter the salt, it becomes very useful. And so maybe the reason that we feel scattered right now is because we were getting too comfortable being in the salt shaker. We were so comfortable with one another that we needed to be scattered a little bit so that we'd get some salt out into other families, into our community, into the world. Maybe that's what part of what we were going to, uh, needed to be doing. Uh, we needed to be scattered a little bit. And I, and I think that this has a lot of application in this book, especially for us and the fact that a lot of us feel very scattered in our lives right now. It, it's also, it's to exiles. Uh, and, and exiles meaning that this is not our home. Our, our citizenship is in heaven. And so all of us have got dual citizenship. Uh, we're citizens of a country here on earth, but our citizenship that really matters, the one that's eternal, uh, is in heaven. And so we are exiles here. And I'll explain more about that in just a minute. And then, and then the other thing is he says that, that are scattered. So it's for Christians who are living scattered lives, living in a place that they wish they were somewhere else and wish that they were actually in heaven. And in the meantime, we're suffering. And you're like, wow, thanks a lot, Arthur. I'm glad I got out of bed and shaved my legs for that. That's what I wanted to hear is that, I, is that um, maybe we're going to need to suffer a little bit. Well, that's, there's more to it than that. So kind of hang on with me. Uh, the purpose of the book is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. And he says this very plainly. He says, my purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. And he says, look, I know things are difficult, but I want to encourage you. I want you to see that there is a way through what we're going through. And so, you know, you kind of ask why, why, you know, so why, why take a look at this? What's the big deal about it? Well, for these new, for these Christians in 63 AD, the world was turned upside down. The, the world was turned upside down because everything that they knew had changed. And so there becomes, a, there's a series of Roman rulers. There's, there's Nero and there's Trajan and there's Diocletian uh, and even later on Caligula and some other Roman rulers, some emperors come along and they start persecuting Christians. Now, it hadn't got, like I said, it hadn't gotten bad yet. Now we get to 1 Peter chapter four, he talks about that, and he's talking about Nero, that he would take Christians, dip them in tar, tie them to poles in the back of the palace and light them at night so that he gave torches in the garden for his parties. Uh, the, there are a lot of historians who make the argument that the Colosseum, and maybe you've been to the Colosseum, uh, and it's a be I mean, I've been there, it's, it's, it's beautiful, it's impressive. You know, you go to Coliseum, get some great pizza across the street. Uh, you can see Hadrian's Arch right across the street. You see all kinds of incredible things happening there. Uh, see Titus's Arch uh, and all these victory things that are there. But a lot of people would make the argument that the Coliseum was built so that Christians could be tortured and killed. Uh, and so uh, it's a pretty remarkable kind of architecture that happened 2,000 years ago. But on the other hand, you think, what was it really for? Because here's the deal is Rome ran the world at this point in time. Uh, everything was 
ruled by Rome. And the Roman Empire was impressive and it was huge, but they had really started drilling down on Christians and it was not popular to be a Christian. And so what happened is these Christ followers come along and they say, we're gonna live our lives differently. And, 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 and the Roman Empire did not like that. They didn't like the fact that they were going to live their lives differently. Uh, you, know, for, you know, for instance, uh, you know, there was, uh, people went to worship and the priest and the priestesses functioned basically as prostitutes. And you were supposed to accumulate all that you can. You were supposed to be stingy with your money and free with your sexual relationships. Uh, your spouse was just to be your heir, was not necessarily someone that you shared intimacy with. And on the other hand, uh, so Christ followers come along and they say, hey, no, 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 we're gonna be generous with everything that we have. Uh, we want to give away things and we're gonna be very intimate with our spouses and we're not going to share spouses and we're not going to worship uh, with prostitutes, not going to do that. Uh, and so uh, people are like, hey, I don't like that. It's a change in culture. And so the, the question sort of is, is I, how, how do we thrive and endure during such a time of persecution? What, what do we do? Because our, our persecution is not that severe. I, I've got a little graphic to show you because here's sort of what our, our persecution is, uh, is right now. We, we've got, uh, we're, we're dealing with justice issues, good cops and bad cops. We're for, you know, we love everybody, we love good cops. Uh, it, you know, we've we got economy issues that are staring at us and coming after us, government overreach, because uh, you know, some people think that's way, way, way. We don't want more government. We want less, less, less. Let us live our lives, please. Uh, our, our church is gonna meet. Most churches in America are still not meeting. Uh, Noonan, LaGrange, we're sort of outliers. Uh, some of you have traveled a little bit and you see other places and you, I mean, you even go downtown Atlanta, it's a ghost town. Uh, I've, I've traveled a little bit in the last five or six months. And you know what, I go to the place and I'm like, wow, it's like, it's like nothing, no virus even exists in Noonan compared to other places. Uh, but a lot of places are, are not, not even meeting. And even when we meet, it's, we're, we're still very careful and it feels a little strange and it's not quite right. Uh, and, all that kind of, and then we've got all these public health issues. And, and these things are all you know, sort of jumping on us and pounding on us a little bit. And it's hard for us to, uh, to kind of process this sometimes. And, and, and the suffering that you are doing it's not a contest. Don't compare your suffering to something. So, well, I'm, I'm suffering more than they are. No, 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 no. Because there are some people who, who are very, very um, worried about things. And some people worried about different things. And sometimes you have those days where you feel like, this is all that I can bear. I don't know that I can take any more. And other days you're just like, I, I, I think I'm okay. It's not so bad. Um, so understand that the, the difficulty that you're enduring is the difficulty that God is, uh, knows that you can handle uh, and he's not going to give you uh, too much to crush you, but he will do, uh, let you have enough to where you realize that you can't do it without him. Um, and, and so uh, non-citizens non uh, can, can be uh, sort of three different things we can look at here. Uh, you mean immigrant. Uh, meaning that I, I'm going to choose to move somewhere and that's where I want to live. Uh, that there are millions of people around the world that would love to come to America. There are millions of people around the world that hate America. Uh, not everybody wants to come here. Not everybody thinks this is Shangri-La. Uh, but there are some people who say, yeah, I, I really want to come here. And they don't want to say, I want to move there. Uh, then there's, there's a tourist. Uh, and this, uh, this is like, a, uh, <laughs> this is going to Disney World. <laughs> okay. Nobody lives in Disney World. It's the happiest place on earth. Right? But you go in there and you walk around and then you, you spend a lot of money and then you leave. Uh, and you, it was, then you go, this is really the happiest place on earth or not so much. Um, and then the, the, the third category is really an exile. Now, here's the thing about an exile. And, th and this is what Peter says, this is how we are living as Christ followers. A few things about exiles. Uh, the first thing about exiles is that we should make our home here until it's time to leave. Uh, and so uh, that means that we're not gonna try and fit in, but we are going to live here. We're gonna build relationships. We're gonna love on people. We're gonna encourage people. We're gonna listen to people. We're gonna do uh, things in a Christ-like way, but we're not trying to be like the people who live here. 
uh, we have different values and a different authority. And so that means that just consequently, we live a different kind of life. And so that means we're going to appear to be weird to those people who don't share our values. Uh, a few years ago, we went to, when my, my oldest son was studying in Spain. And so for, so we, about halfway through the semester, uh, we jumped, all my family, we jumped on a plane and met him in Paris. So my youngest son is riding beside me on the plane. We flew from New York to Paris uh, and we get off of the plane in Paris. We get our luggage. We go out to the a taxi stand and we we're going to get a taxi to the hotel, which is kind of funny. Lori ends up the front of the line, which is kind of funny because uh, Lori and foreign languages just do not get along. And uh, so she tells the taxi driver, uh, she says, we need to go to the Hilton. And he goes, what? <laughs> And then she says, he's going to the Hilton. He said, well, I, I don't understand. And then he goes, Hilton? And she goes, yes, Hilton. And so she talked like that for the next two days. Um, but, but anyway, so we, you know, and we, get, we get, there to the, get there to the hotel, get checked in. My older son meets us there uh, at the uh, shopping area right there beside the hotel. And <clears throat> my younger son looks at me and he says, dad, dad. I said, what? I think all these people are French. Yeah, we're, we're in Paris. This is France. Because see, the whole time over, we, you know, we had, we had flown from Charlotte to New York and we had flown from New York basically with Americans in the plane. We get, all these Americans are getting, and then we get out into the city and like, oh, I'm an exile. This is, these people are not like me. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. Christians had been exiled from Rome. Basically, we've been exiled from our culture. Uh, our, our culture doesn't like us. And, you know, and, and sometimes we feel, I, I just want to be popular. I want them to like us. I don't think we should worry about that so much. I don't think we should ostracize people, that we should alienate them, but we shouldn't compromise our lives just so they'll like us. Um, we should say, no, this is who we are. We're gonna be bold enough to live as Christ followers because we're going to be salt and light into a place that is dark and not very salty. And so I, I want you to know, as, as we walk through this book, I want you to know that, that, that there's a central theme in this book. G. Campbell Morgan says it like this. He says, the Christian life is a life of triumph. And, and that's the theme of this book is that we win. We win. And, and we don't wait until the end of time. We don't just win when we get to heaven. We win now. We win. We triumph. The, the trials are temporary, but triumph is forever. Uh, it, it lasts a, a long time. And so let me show you some, some blessings that, well, that Peter talks about to those who are Christ followers. And you begin to get the sense of how we triumph. Uh, beginning in verse three. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So he has shown us mercy and kindness, even though we don't deserve it, because mercy is not getting what you deserve. He shows us mercy and this mercy of not getting what we deserve, which is wake up in hell today, that's what we deserve. But instead he has given us new birth and it's a, a, that results in a living hope. It's not just a medicine, it is something that is a tug on us. And I'll finish this up with you in just a minute. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into uh, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So we've got an extraordinary inheritance. It says who through faiths are shielded by God's power unto the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. And so there's a lot of words I put there in yellow. I, would, I think it would be a great idea to go back and look at each one of those things this week and say, look, this is a blessing from God. This is a blessing from God. This is a blessing from God. Living hope, uh, the resurrection, the salvation, uh, inheritance, all these things. It says, all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So even though things are difficult, remember there's all these blessings that you've got. And then it says, well, there's some burdens that we've got to deal with too. And, and so in verse six, he's, he kind of gets at this. He says, uh, you may have to have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. It says, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So when we see Jesus, and we don't have to wait to heaven for this to happen, 
But when we go through these various trials, what do they do? They refine us. And he uses the illustration of something like taking gold and putting it in a fire and you melt out all the dross and the crud and the trash and all that's left is something that's pure and it's refined by fire. And so these various trials are bringing about a deepening in us in our relationship with Jesus. And then he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It says concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It says, here's what's going on. The prophets wanted to know, those are the guys in the Old Testament, they wanted to know the life that you now live. They would have gladly endured any amount of suffering to know Jesus like you know him. Because see, they're on the other side of the cross. We're on this side of the cross. He says... It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. The things that you know because of your relationship with Jesus, angels want to know. They haven't experienced what you have experienced. That's how rich it is. So the blessings outweigh the burdens. I mean, it's not even close. So the book of 1 Peter is all about triumph. It's about victory. It's about conquering. And so I jotted down a few things that I want to drill down on quickly about ways that we triumph, okay? So we we triumph through a number of things, but here's just four, okay? Uh, We triumph, first of all, through, through through the new birth. We triumph in that there is hope that lasts forever for us. It's not just the medicine. It's not just something that gets through a difficult ordeal, a difficult time. Uh, and, I, and it, you know, and, and birth is this, I mean, hum, I mean, tremendous transition. I mean, have you, ever, have, have you been around when a baby's born? And there's all this, this pain and struggle and pressure and fear and excitement. And then whew, here it is. You know, you know, we had some friends who had a baby just a few weeks ago. And because of everything that's going on, we couldn't go see them at the hospital when they had the baby. And so we had to wait until the baby got home. And so, we, we, and so a couple of weeks ago, we went and stood on their front porch. And they held the baby and we stayed about six or eight feet away. And went, hey, little baby. How you been? And, but man, you see this little tiny baby and go, wow, look. And I, I, I don't know that there's a, a better metaphor that, that God could have used because, you know, when, when you look at this little baby, you go, man, there's so much hope and joy and promise wrapped up all there. And he says, you've got so much to be hopeful about. Uh, N.T. Wright says this. He says, becoming a Christian means that what God did for Jesus at Easter, he does for you in the very depth of your being. Did you know that, did you know that you know, we celebrate Easter every year with thousands of people? This year, I celebrate Easter by looking into a camera because we didn't have Easter worship services this year. We had them, it was all online. And I remember how weird all of that felt because uh, even when I didn't know Jesus and I was a kid, you know, Easter was a big deal. But you know, you get to have your own personal Easter. I mean, at this point, you know who has come back from the dead? Jesus. That's it. He came back from the dead. He didn't die again. Lazarus came back from the dead. He died again. But you're gonna have your own personal Easter. That's the new birth, that that God is going to raise you up. You're going to take your last breath here and then you exhale and your 
you inhale and you're in the presence of Jesus. I mean, I, I, I just don't think that when that happens, you go, all right, well, here I am. I think, I think it's going to be, I think we're talking about rejoicing. I think we're going to get out of hand with that just a little bit. Uh, but but we, we triumph through the new birth. We triumph through suffering. Like Arthur, I really didn't want to hear that. But, 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 but we do because what happens is in our suffering, what happens, we get this deepening. And, and, and the, who are the Christ followers that you want to spend time around? You want to spend time around other Christ followers who are walking really close with Jesus, don't you? Those are like, my, whatever that guy's got, I want it to rub off on me. I, I need more of that. And, you know, and typically that guy who really walks close with Jesus, yeah, they read the Bible. Yeah, they pray. Yeah, they go to church. Yeah, they give. But you know what really makes a difference? They have endured suffering. And nobody says, oh, pick me, pick me, put me in, coach. I want to suffer some. No, 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 nobody does that. But here's what's really great is we get to keep what our suffering produces. But you don't have to do it with the other stuff. The wheelchair you ride around in, the chronic pain, the headaches, the cancer, the loneliness, the rejection, all that disappears. When you get to heaven, no moodiness. Every, everything, every day's a good day. No, ugh, I'm moving a little slow today. None of that. And, and this, this new birth that leads to suffering, it, it results in joy. It results in this inexpressible joy. This joy that flows out of us. And listen, on your hardest day, on your hardest day, when it is awful and things have fallen apart, when you've lost the job, when you've lost the opportunity, when you've lost the marriage, when you've lost the kid, I mean, whatever, on your worst day. And, and listen, and listen, I, listen, I've been here. And my, my short, hot, sweet wife says, hey, we need to worship through this. I'm like, I don't want to hear that right now. I know you're right, but I just don't want to right now. And I, and I try and worship the Lord through gritted teeth and a hardened heart and an angry spirit. But when I battle through that, do I get some joy that's unspeakable? Yeah. And, and, and the great thing about it is that we get this inheritance too. And, and we have access to this inheritance now. See, don't sit here and think, ooh, well, if I'll just tough it out for 50 years and then I get to heaven, I'll be okay. No, it's not that way. It's not that way. Almost, I'm not a morning person. I almost never get up before the sun rises except on Sunday mornings. And this morning, I'm driving to church in darkness and I sat in my office and the blind, had the blinds open and I sat there and I watched the dawn this morning. I hadn't planned to do this. It just happened. I don't, don't, don't is a noun, but it's also a verb. It's not just a, so when, it's not just thinking about a brand new day, but thinking about living a brand new way. And Peter says, look, you can live differently. You don't have to keep living the same way that you're living. You, you can, because you've got this inheritance. And, and here, here's the thing about this inheritance. Well, ordinarily, what triggers an inheritance is death. What triggers our inheritance is resurrection. I, have, have you ever been a part of a family fight over an inheritance? All right, because ordinarily, uh, that, that, it, it drives people away from one another, but this inheritance drives people into relationship with one another. Instead of uh, away from one another, uh, it drives us into relationship with one another. Instead of something, uh, ordinarily, an inheritance divides people. I'll take mine, you take yours. It divides families. An inheritance creates, our spiritual inheritance creates relationships, creates family. Instead of it being about belongings, it's about belonging. Instead of being about stuff, it's like I got somebody to stay with. Instead of saying, well, I'm, 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 I'm out of the will, 
because you're always having to tiptoe around. I don't want to make that person upset because they'll write me out of the will. I want the inheritance. <laughs> Instead of it being about out, it's like, hey, you're in. As a matter of fact, check this out. This is as good as it gets. When we were at our worst, he wrote us in. When we were terrible people, we hadn't done a single good thing. He says, you're in the will. You get it. You get everything, every spiritual blessing under heaven. And so we, we look at things differently. We're in this tunnel and we're driving through this long, long, long tunnel. And you're like, well, wait, wait, where's the end of it? Where does the light come on? I mean, is, is it ever going to get better? Am I going to get out of this tunnel that I'm in right now? But what do we do, man? We, we keep going. We keep going knowing that we've got access to our inheritance right now, that we can know Jesus, that we're not going through this by ourselves. So, so while you're waiting, number one, uh, name the pain. Name, name the pain, say, God, this hurts. And say, tell them what it is. Name it. And, and, and then examine it. Say, look, this is, who, this is what it is. This is what it's doing to me. This is how I feel. And, and then, uh, then, 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 com, then compare it. C compare it to your inheritance. It ain't that big a deal. Even if you've got some chronic illness that you will have to deal with for the rest of your life. It's nothing compared to all of forever in the presence of Jesus. Put it in perspective. Number two, go for a walk. Listen, every now and then, my wife, she knows when I'm having a hard time, she says, Arthur, you need to go for a walk because I've been through hard times. I've been through difficult circumstances. And you know, and what helped me more than anything was getting out of the house, out of the office, away from people and just walking and just hearing from God. And I have gone for walks and I have yelled at God because I'm mad at him and I have cried when I've been walking and I have pleaded that he would do things and he just listens to me. Go for a walk. Uh, literally go for a walk, uh, metaphorically uh, go for a walk, is keep walking with Jesus. As you're going through this tunnel, keep walking through the tunnel with him. Don't, don't walk away from him. It, you're not going to be able to handle it so well by yourself. And, and, and vicariously go for a walk. What, what do I mean by that? I, I mean that remember that there are people that would give their left arm to know Jesus the way that you know him. They would love to walk through the difficulties that you're walking through because they would know Jesus in a way that you, they've never known him before. Number three, understand the future. Understand the future. See, you know this is what's gonna happen. You know that your, your difficulty, your trial, your suffering, your difficulty, the thing, because like, why did this happen at my house? And uh, why is there a, a virus all over the place? And why are we struggling financially? And why is my kids driving me crazy? And da, 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 just one thing after another. And you're like, why is all this stuff going on? You know that when you get to the other side of that, that you're going to look and go, oh, look what God did. And you're going to worship him. You're going to like, wow, God, you did all that for me? And it's just remembering and realizing that that's what he's going to do for you, that he's going to help you get to a point where you understand. And when you, if you would think ahead to the future, say, this is for my good. He's going to do something for me. And listen, I, that is hard to do. I have been in situations where I just want to lay on the floor and just leave me alone. Just don't talk to me right now. But say, no, he's going to do something powerful and I'm going to understand the future and that's what he does. And the last one, number four, is feel the tug of home. Feel the tug of home. So, see, what happens, Hebrews says that this living hope that we have is like an anchor for our soul. And so, this new birth that results in living hope through the resurrection, he says, is like an anchor for our soul. Meaning it's not just, a, oh, help, I hope I feel better, but 
I am tied to my inheritance and my promise that's in heaven. Now, here's the thing is that we get to have God is such a gracious God. He gives us all kinds of slack in the rope. And so we can go as far as we want to. And you know what? And we still say tied. We still say anchored. But in the meantime, there's lots of slack. And, and you have those times you're like, I don't feel so close to God right now. And it's probably because you got a lot of slack in the rope. Because God will let you have a whole lot and walk around and do whatever you want to go do. And he'll still love you anyway. And what if instead we would say, I'm going to do is I'm going to tighten up the slack in the rope because I want to feel the tug of home. That's what I want to do. And, and you know how that happens? It happens through worship. Because when we praise and worship our King, it's like putting part of us in His presence. You know, He breathed His air into us in the Garden of Eden. So when we sing, the Bible says it is like an incense that floats up toward heaven and goes into heaven and God inhabits the praises of his people. That's why sometimes when you're worshiping Christian, you feel very close to God. You're like, oh, I just sense the presence of the Lord today. You know why? Because you could feel the tug of home. That's why. So if you want to have a little more steadiness in your life, you want to feel the tug of home, be sure and be close to God, worship Him. It's what we were made to do anyway. God didn't need a friend. He wasn't lonely. He meant to be worshipers. Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, this hope does not put us in a rocking chair where we complacently await the return of Jesus. Instead, it puts us in the marketplace and on the battlefield and keeps us going when the burdens are heavy and the battles are hard. He said, hope is not a sedative. It is a shot of adrenaline. So there's a guy in Nashville, Nash Vegas. 10 or 15 years ago, and he, he picks up this little dorky looking copy of the Declaration of Independence. Like somebody took a cigarette and rolled around the edges to make it look aged and squirted lemon juice on it or something. He pays $2 for it at a yard sale, goes home, hangs it up in his garage. His name's Stan Caffey. And so he's got this thing hanging up in the garage, and he just kind of, you know, because it was just something to do. He had posters and everything, like, oh, whatever. Right, so uh, th and then he decides he's going to get married shortly after that, and so he and his fiance are combining households, and so they're kind of going through what are we going to keep, what are we going to throw away, and so it's kind of you know you keeping the socks, yes, I'm keeping the socks, you keeping the the pitcher, yeah, I want the pitcher, no, get rid of the pitcher. So she, you know she says yeah, get rid of the pitcher. He says yeah, I'll get rid of the pitcher. Declaration of Independence, right? So they have a yard sale because they're combining households. Uh, he sells it for four dollars. He thinks well, I bought it for two, I sold it for four. I'm doing okay. Well, it turns out that the guy who has it holds on to it for about 10 years, keeps it in his house. And then uh, a friend comes in and looks at it and says, hey, I think this is something else. And so he takes it to one of these antiques roadshow kind of places and says, right, so I think this is just, you know, something I bought at a yard sale, probably didn't mean anything. And the examiner, uh, appraiser looks at it and says, no, no, actually this is a copy of the Declaration of Independence. This is John Quincy Adams ordered 200 copies to be made. And this is one of those 200 copies that's worth about $400,000. That guy's name was Michael Sparks, uh, who paid $4 and got a $400,000 return. I would, I'm glad I was not there for the conversation of the original owner, Stan Caffey, when he told his wife, you just cost me $400,000. I'm never throwing anything away again. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, but, so, but, but so Arthur, whatever, what's the point? Well, here's the point. I don't want to waste my life knowing that I have the power of the resurrected Christ in me, that I'm gonna be resurrected again and just be hanging on the wall somewhere. God did something priceless in me, he's done something priceless in you. So shouldn't we worship him and shouldn't we do something with that? 
Shouldn't we use what he's done for us in the lives of people around us?